Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Eckstein Hall to Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Gouche, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers, people who are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Uh, today, we are joined by the Milwaukee County Executive, Chris Abley. Won't you please give him a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. We have a lot to talk about today. We want to cover a lot of ground, so uh, we'll get right into it. And uh, we'll talk about the, the county today. You, you were elected, I think, back in 2011 mm -hmm. uh, was the year. And uh, at the time, uh, there had just been a report by the Public Policy Forum that essentially asked about county government, should it stay or should it go? And, and the reason for that was the county was in dire fiscal shape. Uh, according to the Public Policy Forum. So that's what you've inherited. It's now 2017. How would you describe the state of the county's fiscal health today? Uh, better asterisk. Uh, I guess in, in answer to the question of should it stay or should it go, obviously I was on the, the stay side. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Uh, uh, and better asterisk means this. Uh, we have worked hard uh, and had some success lowering uh, our liabilities. Uh, restoring services, we do, and adding new programs. We didn't have a Department of Economic Development. We do now, and it's been instrumental in uh, probably, you know, over half a billion dollars worth of projects. Uh, we provide a lot of services. I've got a leadership team that I'm incredibly proud of uh, that are in government because they believe in public service. They work hard. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess the asterisk would be this. Uh, in county government, sort of like uh, city government, uh, some of the biggest variables that impact our stability are not ones I directly control, or the county does. Uh, our biggest source of revenue isn't here, it's uh, about 70 miles west of here in the state capital. And, uh, I know the mayor has uh, been speaking recently about the degree to which uh, the percentage of dollars that you all send to the state that come back has been declining. Uh, the same is true for the county, the same is true for UWM, for MPS, and uh, I'm not saying that uh, a, uh, this is, you know, a whine. Um, I think the state does better when Milwaukee does better. Um, but I am saying it restricts my ability to address even more quickly a lot of the, you know, rest whether it's restoring services or paying down debt. Uh, the good news uh, is, uh, in addition to a good team, better service, uh, you know, we have, as I said, we've lowered liabilities. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about is there's more pride uh, and what I mean by that is, so in 2011, for those who don't remember, uh, the governor had just gotten elected uh, and uh, we, uh, Act 10 passed, and, but the budget that I inherited had assumed some of the savings of Act 10. So the tools that we had, because that was sort of the big metaphor, were somewhat limited. Uh, and just as an example, um, child support as a department, um, you know, the morale was not great. Uh, and uh, as a result of the first state budget I was dealing with, we would have had to cut about 24, 25 people. Um, we backfilled, so we only cut about 12. But that's not a great way uh, to start out. Um, so the end of the first year, we set uh, all-time records in the history of the department for how many people we served. The end of the second year, we beat all those records. We got Department of the Year for the state, first time ever, Employee of the Year, one of three in the country to get this fatherhood grant. Uh, the end of uh, the third year, we were the first in the country to partner with the DA's office, so the people who can pay but don't, uh, we have very limited tools, and all of a sudden we had much better tools when they go out of state. We had some very high profile cases, this reality TV star who owed a quarter million dollars in LA. We wouldn't have been able to catch him before, we did. Uh, and it wasn't just a quarter million dollars for those kids, which isn't a small impact, it's life changing. Uh, it's the visibility that we have more teeth, which means a lot of the people who owed but weren't paying suddenly called up and thought, hey, I, we don't want to be on TV either. But here's the thing. Uh, we, uh, uh, and then finally, we got the biggest grants for fatherhood uh, that the feds have ever given for that program and the only one in the country. We hosted the national conference here in Milwaukee because we're the fastest improving child support agency in the country. Uh, we went from zero in programming for dads to about 6,000 uh, folks a year, and that's job training, job placement, license recovery. Uh, but the thing that I really like, and this is back to the pride, 
anybody who's been in an organization that's seen that kind of improvement, especially when you've come from a place where there just wasn't that excitement, knows what it's like to be in any organization that feels real good about what they're doing. When you walk into that office, you can feel it. And you ask people, hey, where do you work? I work with the best child support agency in the country. Don't bet against us. I mean, that is not a small thing. It may, be not, be, it may not be a tangible thing, but now in government, you know, with sort of epic cynicism, one of the goals I had in 2011 was fiscal. The other one was earn back, earn back some trust in government. I, I, I want to ask you about something else that the county only controls to, mm -hmm. to some extent, and that is, um, as we all know, uh, in 2001, this new enhanced pension system yep. went into effect. So you had these big one-time backdrop payments, as they were known, to, to county employees that began then, uh, in addition to regular pensions. Um, you still have uh, thousands of pension obligations. Um, yep. How much does that um, weigh on the future of Milwaukee County? A lot. Uh, a lot, and, and, and it's the worst kind of problem because it pits two groups of people uh, that are right to ha about their concerns. You've got thousands of retirees who are absolutely right to expect what they were promised. Uh, and uh, you've got taxpayers uh, who are thinking, hey, we're paying for this government to deliver services and we want every dime that's possible to go straight into services. Uh, what happened is over the years, uh, administration after administration just layered on an incredibly complicated set of benefits that has all sorts of different classifications uh, and promised a lot of things that cost more than they were able to uh, you know, deliver without eating into the rest of the budget. Um, you know, that's a continuing problem. The good news is in the last five uh, years, there was a five-year period recently, I don't know if it's exactly the last five years, but the journal had a nice article about this. Uh, our unfunded health liabilities at the county uh, are a little over half a billion dollars better. Um, and that's in a period where the city's got about $60 million worse. Uh, you know, we have a long way to go, but we're progressing a lot faster. The frustration for me is, uh, you know, and I think the mayor expresses this in, in a somewhat similar way, I wish the relationship between Milwaukee and the state was seen as more of an aligned partnership, if it was just clearer. Uh, I don't think the answer is simply saying the state's the enemy. I'm proud to be a Wisconsinite. I think what's, uh, what we need to work on is a clearer share and understanding that, that everyone in Milwaukee uh, you know, has uh, our interests are aligned with the state and the state's interests are aligned with ours. And as I like to say, if you're just a fiscal guy, if I'm at the state and the only goal I have is increase as fast as possible the state budget, the single highest return I can make on investment is investing more here. Uh, and you look at data for the last, say, 2007, 2015, Milwaukee County sends about a quarter billion dollars more to the state than we did. Uh, and we get uh, dollar adjusted a significant amount less back. So I, I want to ask you about something that, again, is pension related. And, and there's a story in the, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Mm -hmm. It was published late this morning. And it's about uh, a problem with payouts to uh, a person who gets a pension from Milwaukee County. There were mistakes made. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of additional money was paid to this person that this person should not be getting. But this is not the first time that there have been problems in payouts, and the state's back even before your time, certainly. Um, but there are problems. And, and the question I have is, at least one county supervisor, Sheldon Wasserman, former Democratic state lawmaker, mm -hmm. is saying it's time for the county to get out of the pension business. You fired the pension system administrator, but he'd like to see the county do what all the other counties in Wisconsin do and have the state administer mm -hmm. their pensions. Is that possible? Would you have the county get out of the business of administering its own pension? Well, first, just probably goes without saying, but to be clear, the outcome we're looking for is whatever the mechanism for the most stable, effective, and prudent investment. And to me, that, that outcome is far more important to me than the tactic. I mean, but to that example, you could be forgiven for looking at the best managed pension system in the country, which is the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and if I'm one of the thousands of pensioners, I mean, it doesn't sound like a crazy idea to look into 
didn't do. Um, right now, uh, as is generally the case, you know, we just found out about this error, and anytime I find out about anything, I mean, anyone in this position, you do what you have to do, which is let's aggressively look and what else, you know, how, how fast can we fix it? But uh, I think it's always worth asking that question. Uh, the management of, uh, or the, let's see, provision of programs or any responsibility in government, there tends to be a sort of turfy thinking. Uh, I've said this before, I'm always uncomfortable when electeds use possessive pronouns. My, our, my constituents, our this, our that. Well, it's not yours, it's, it's yours, it's public. Uh, you know, the resources we're making decisions about aren't mine and how this, the impact of that kind of thinking on making a decision, for instance, if it ever made sense for the county to say, hey, state, you do a phenomenal job managing the pension, you manage all the other counties, why don't you manage this one? Um, if it was just about, uh, uh, just about you know, dispassionate clinical objective uh, decision making, it might seem a little more, uh, uh, less, or less likely to counter resistance, but as we've all seen, the amount of decisions in public policy that are just about facts, data, analysis, risk, contingency, best practices uh, is not as, uh, not as high a percentage as we'd like. Uh, and it's something that people are emotional about. Uh, you know, I've had, in the last election actually, there was, uh, I remember thinking it was interesting, there was uh, accusations of power grab. And that notion to me is very much related to the fact that starting uh, nothing uh, that none of the resources I make decisions about are uh, resources that are mine, they're yours. Uh, and what matters most is the outcome. So as an example to say, when I would try and say, look, that's not my goal. Uh, in 2011, Milwaukee County was running Milwaukee County Family Care. We do a really good job of it. And then we started off so much that we were doing it for other counties uh, up to uh, eight. Uh, different counties where Milwaukee County is managing, other counties are getting better value for a better price, better service, uh, and, uh, and then what did I do? I helped them spin off because it's not about turf, it's about what's the most effective way to serve people. When we passed the law that changed um, the mental health, uh, created the mental health board to change the governance of the behavioral health division, you know, that takes a ton of uh, decision making and governance uh, away from the county. Um, if the goal was more authority, well, you know, we're, we're not doing a good job, but the goal wasn't that. The goal is what's happened, which is deficits to surpluses, serving more people, less involuntary restraints. But I say this because for decisions like a pension, uh, we do social services at the county and pensions in particular are so personal and they are, you know, there's a lot of emotions rightly about it. So making decisions uh, uh, as devoid as possible uh, of turfiness and uh, as sort of founded and premised as much as possible and a kind of a shared sense of what's right, long term consistent for the public uh, can be tricky. Uh, but, but you again, think it's worth a discussion? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the, the, the things that, that your administration has been involved in, and I'll, I'll try and go down these um, fairly rapidly. Um, and this deals with uh, fiscal issues again. Um, you proposed uh, in your budget a, uh, a vehicle registration fee, yep. uh, an increase of $60 per car. The county board knocked that down to 30. You signed off on that. And this will help pay for transportation needs, for new buses, for for some road issues that we have here. Is 30 bucks a car going to get the job done, or are we still going to be facing uh, fiscal issues because we didn't yeah. do a bigger amount? Uh, well, short answer, uh, it's not enough. Uh, I didn't put in, uh, in the budget, a $60 wheel uh, tax because I like the idea of a wheel tax. 0.0, .0 people like the idea of a wheel tax. Uh, <laughs> what's a better solution? Well, see earlier discussion about how about Milwaukee getting a higher percentage of what we pay to the state back. That would make it a lot easier. We still get less back from the state on transit than we did in 2009. Uh, and here's the thing, I've kept bus fares flat for, what, six years now. Uh, uh, and we've done that by putting more tax levy, local tax levy, in because, you know, for the 150,000 rides a day, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's getting people to work, and I don't want to make that harder. But uh, the number we put in the wheel tax is just this. We have a couple of things that aren't in our control that are increasing our costs. The amount we're getting back uh, increase from the state uh, we'll put it this way, our expenses are growing faster than our revenue by about 18 to 25 million. So the uh, wheel tax proposal we put in 
the reason you saw our independently elected controller uh, testify for it, Rob Hankin from the Policy Forum, AFSCME, uh, and MMAC, is probably the only time they both you know, lobbied for the same thing, isn't, again, because anyone likes a wheel tax. It's because we like a lot less the notion of bus fees going to $7, and that's about what we'd be talking about, and cutting routes, and it would get worse. Uh, you know, one of the concerns I think we have is that people aren't as clear as much about how dire uh, that is. And these days, you know, trying to get uh, outrage level concern on an issue is tricky when outrage seems to be a daily, sometimes hourly uh, <laughs> eruption somewhere. I'm not tweeting any of this, by the way. So, yeah. so um, I hear you saying that, that we're still going to face challenges in we terms of transit are. Yep. because of that. Uh, something transit related again that you've been a big fan of and are trying to build support for and actually something that may happen in the mm -hmm. very near future is called bus rapid transit. So think about if you got on a bus down around where the couture is going to be built. So you're talking about down near the Milwaukee Art Museum, that area. And you could take a bus that would have fewer stops and could take you all the way out to the Milwaukee County Regional uh, com Complex, um, Regional Medical Complex, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, maybe instead of taking you 51 minutes on a normal bus route, it might take you 35. It might be competitive with going out on the freeway during rush hour. That's, that's the goal. How soon could we see this here in the Milwaukee area? Well, there's another asterisk. Uh, so uh, a lot of that depends on uh, federal funding. Um, you know, one thing that I think you'll hear from any elected executive in any metro area in the country right now is everybody's paying a lot of attention to the new administration departmental picks because the direction of HUD nationally or DO, Department of Justice uh, or Department of Human Services has a profound impact on the services we deliver one way or another. And while it's always uh, reasonable to expect a change in any new administration, Often there's a bit more predictability, um, you know, just what's it going to mean? I mean, so our new director of HUD uh, is uh, uh, Ben Carson, who I'm sure he's a nice guy and he's a good doctor. Uh, uh, but, you know, it just, and maybe, just, I don't want to presume the worst, I mean, maybe things would be great, but it just makes it very hard uh, for us uh, at, you know, city and county level where we, at millions and millions of dollars, I mean, at a significant level, have interactions with those departments. So with transportation, you know, I mean, Trump has talked about increasing infrastructure spending by a trillion dollars over 10 years. If that's an increase, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's maybe. no, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we could do it. I know, it, there are ways in which that could happen where we may not be talking about BRT for a while, but the broader point, the reason that the regional medical complex likes it is they're out in Tosa, and you know, for those of you who haven't been out recently, the Medical College, Children's Hospital, Freighter, uh, Curative, I mean, all those groups, it's, what, 15, 16,000 employees and growing like crazy. They're having a hard time hiring. They like it because they want to be able to hire people from downtown. They have a big parking issue. It takes roads, uh, cars off the road. There's a lot of people downtown who need jobs. There's hiring programs being started and training at MATC to help fill the jobs out there. I mean, this is such a win-win-win. The projected ridership, something about 9,000. Uh, you know, we'll do what we can. Is it safe to say you were considerably more optimistic six months ago than you are today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of so many ways I could answer that question. Uh, hey, ask me about how the beer gardens did last weekend. How about that? I know. It was warm out. It was time for a cold beer, no question. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about something that, that to some people sounded like an awfully ambitious goal. I think back in 2015, you said yep. you wanted to end chronic homelessness yep. in Milwaukee County. Where are you in that, uh, in that uh, quest? Uh, actually, the good news is uh, slightly ahead of schedule. You uh, ended it in three years, I think, didn't you yeah, say that? You know, three years? Three years to functional zero, which is a, just so we get the terms here. Uh, a functional zero, it's a, a HUD term, uh, and that uh, if you get to functional zero in chronic homelessness, that doesn't mean you're not occasionally going to see somebody uh, who's homeless. What it does mean, or would fit into that category, what it does mean is if you do, 
it's because the staff we have, not passively, but actively going out to look to offer services hasn't gotten to them yet. Uh, and chronic homelessness, as distinct from homelessness writ large, is also a term of art. It means people who are homeless for over a year uh, or more than three times in four years. Uh, and so as you can imagine, uh, this is uh, easily the most vulnerable of that subset. About 70% of that group have issues with mental health. Uh, any law enforcement agency will tell you these are people they run and encounter a lot. Uh, it's hard if they have alcohol and drug issues for them to stabilize. They end up in emergency rooms a lot, expensively and ineffectively. And what's great about this housing first model, permanent housing, uh, is it's not just the housing, it's programming. Over in the big picture, though, it saves money. Less emergency room visits, uh, more of their ability to focus time on more you know, emergencies, uh, less time for law enforcement wanting to do the right thing but not sure what to do because, again, when you're dealing with folks with mental illness, we said we'd get to uh, functional zero in three years. We got, uh, we're about 75% uh, of the way there. And uh, I was, uh, my health and human services director, Hector Cologne, one of that team I was mentioning that makes me really proud. He's our, uh, he's just a rock star. But we were asked uh, in the last month or so of the Obama administration to present at the White House about uh, the success of that model. And um, I mean, to me, you know, that's, that's what we should be doing in government. You leave nobody behind. You don't give up on anybody. And everything's focused on empower, not subsistence, empowerment. That leads me to my next question. That's about the, the I guess you could call it newly created Office of African American mm -hmm. Affairs, something that you and the county board uh, felt strongly about. Mm -hmm. um, what's the goal here? What, what realistically can the Office of African American Affairs do to reduce some of the widely known disparities that exist in this community? Well, I think the first goal is to, uh, among other things, change the culture in Milwaukee so we don't phrase every question about changing the disparities with a sort of right out of the gate cynicism. I mean, one of the things I say about- Did I sound that way when I asked that? Not at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, no, no, no. Uh, but I mean, just realistically, uh, I, you know, I mean, there's no other responsible way to approach uh, uh, government. I mean, first, the first role is to get better data. So when we say, unemployment disparities, graduation disparities, incarceration disparities, exactly what are we talking about? So let's measure, uh, and so we have a baseline, both to better understand where we can more, in the most leveraged way, reallocate resources, uh, and then also to see, are we making a difference? Uh, and then, uh, so what we've done first is, uh, at the county, we've got 41 business lines, where you know the airport is a business line. Uh, we do a huge range of things, and one of the things we very early on did is with every department division said, where do you interact with the African American community? Where are there opportunities uh, where you could do it more effectively, more empowering, what's working, what could work better? Uh, and even to the point of, does everybody know what everyone else is doing? And I'll tell you right now, just starting with workforce, you know, we now know we have eight different areas in the county where we're doing workforce training. Uh, initially, that was about when we started measuring about uh, just under 1,000 uh, folks uh, a year. Now it's closer to 2,000. Um, but when we know, all right, we do housing, uh, we do job training, uh, you know, and uh, the overlap between people who come through uh, a lot of our departments is significant, but not always aware to the different departments. So if somebody is going through one part of the criminal justice system and we know and we can connect them with the right kind of caseworker or training or treatment or whatever it is, uh, we'll do a better job of that. Uh, the other, uh, the sort of the next step is to look at, um, uh, you know, our ability to coordinate what we do with the city. So the city's all, also um, looking at an Office of African American Affairs, and I've been talking to the Common Council President, Ashanti Hamilton, who's a good friend, and we agreed really early on, look, we don't need to duplicate here. Uh, if there's one thing that we should probably all agree that we can work on together, it's this. Uh, it's, you know, reduce the incarceration rate, reduce the unemployment rate, increase the graduation rate, uh, and get more meaningful. So in our last budget already, it's changed, uh, it's already uh, uh, the awareness has informed our budget. Uh, for five years, it's always been the case that the biggest increases that we've done in the county budget have gone to the city. Um, but the things we've, uh, we've added a ton in terms of programming and social services, that's why we put so much into uh, 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 
transit and we're very aware of, okay, let's look about where, what services are where. Child support, I just mentioned, uh, specifically has this new program that is uh, targeted entirely, uh, 53206, that zip code. Uh, and this is how you can feel good about our director of child support. We measure uh, on uh, 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 four sta sort of standard measures, uh, child support, and we get reimbursed based on a performance on some of these measures. And if it's just about how successful you are working with the population, there's an argument to say, well, let's work with the easiest to work with population because our you know, reimbursement rate. Uh, we're going into uh, a, an area that's difficult to work with precisely because it's got the highest need. And I'm happy to say our first quarter uh, goals, uh, I see uh, Jim Sullivan's up there. Sorry, man, I'm embarrassing you. That's our director of child support right there, Jim Sullivan. He's And Jim Sullivan, your first quarter of this program beat the goals that they set. Uh, but the idea is if we know with parks on a capital plan, we're going to work on a park that's in a city neighborhood and we've got housing. So, all right, if parks is going to be over here, let's focus on housing around here. And we know we have job training programs. All right, well, is there a nearby nonprofit? It's just that awareness and coordination. But above all of this, the purpose of the office is to keep front of mind, not just an occasional op-ed in the journal, uh, or a conference here and there on every decision we make with every department and every division, not sometimes, all the time, are we moving the ball forward on the disparities in uh, the African American community. And the other one, and just finally, is sort of the goal setting for it to kind of hold up a torch a little bit. And, you know, I often say we have this problem sometimes in Milwaukee where we accept the inevitability of things that we don't want to change or we don't think can change. Um, and very often, like say, end chronic homelessness faster with permanent housing than anyone else has done the met, you know, I mean, in the country for a metro. No one's ever done that. And there was a lot of people who were skeptical at the front end, but there's this interesting thing that happens when you get people to go work for a goal that they don't think they can get or it's harder than they've ever done. They, if they believe in it, they work harder. And that's why I can tell you we're ahead of it. So nobody can tell me that we can't make a difference. So goal setting isn't improve or lower the incarceration rate or the graduate, improve the graduation rate. The goal is what has to happen for Milwaukee and Wisconsin to have the lowest African-American incarceration rate, the lowest disparities in graduation, the lowest uh, or heck, parity. Uh, 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 and in jobs, and that doesn't mean maybe today, tomorrow, next year, but if we don't aim that way, we're never gonna get there, and that's as important of the role of the office as uh, anything else. I, I wanna follow up on something. So, so the bottom line there is aim high, but, but I wanna follow up on something you said in that answer. You, you talked about job training, workforce training, and, and I wanna ask you about what's happening in, in the Park East area, hmm. which after sitting there for about 15 years will be pretty much fully developed in, in the next five years. Uh, when all of the construction is done. Um, this law school partnered with the Business Journal of Milwaukee recently to, to look at the issue of the skills gap in Milwaukee, but, but the focus was really on whether or not we are in, for back, lack of a better way of putting it, a transformational moment for Milwaukee. There is a lot of stuff going on in this city. There are, there's a tremendous need for skilled labor yep. in this city. And some of these projects are bringing people from nearby neighborhoods into the workforce mm -hmm. and have the potential to change not just, in my opinion, individuals' lives, but families' lives, neighborhoods, all of that. You Do you think we're in a transformational moment in this, this community's history? I think we can be. Uh, I mean, you know, first part of that question is you're right. Park East was, you know, essentially dormant for 15 years. And, uh, you know, I mean, now, six months ago, we announced 100% uh, of the Park East outside of the arena, 100% is committed to and developed for all of those projects. Uh, yes, there's the economic impact. There's thousands of jobs, hundreds of millions uh, of investment. It'll be huge for the tax re property tax revenue, which means all of us will have more to in government to deliver services with. But what we've done is we've used the Park East compact requirements for all of those projects, which have uh, minimums for uh, minority contracting, residency, et cetera. But we've actually gone further. Um, we created a program a while ago in partnership with the workforce and MATC called Uplift, mm -hmm. uh, again, targeted at unemployment in uh, 53206, income eligibility, neediest areas. Uh, that already uh, average starting salary has been over $15 an hour. Uh, and so those are good jobs for starting and low-skilled jobs. And the Marcus project, which is, was one of the last pieces of Park East, 
uh, in addition to the perk, they agreed, hey, when that's built, uh, two to 300 jobs, they will hire uplift graduates. Um, we're using that leverage on every project, including the ones that aren't in the Park East. We got the same requirements uh, to be agreed to with uh, the Couture. Uh, this, the scale of construction projects now, I'm hardly the first person saying this, uh, in Milwaukee is uh, larger by far than anything we've seen in decades. So we have this opportunity to leverage this uh, uh, to have a lot more of an impact than big buildings. Uh, this can be a lot of more empowered lives. Uh, and a lot more, uh, 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 you know, opportunity for the city, and hopefully to address back to you know what the purpose of the Office of African American Affairs, uh, some of the you know I think the biggest challenge the metro area has. I, I want to uh, touch on a, a few issues that um, some of which are, are policy issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they're all policy issues in a way, but. But let me walk through a, a few of these. Um, recently, the the Milwaukee County Board signed. Uh, or created an anti-discrimination resolution, which essentially said that undocumented um, immigrants are welcome in this community, that they're mm -hmm. welcome in Milwaukee County. There was a huge rally on the steps of the courthouse. You spoke at that rally. Yeah. You have signed this resolution, mm -hmm. uh, this anti-discrimination resolution. You know, to some people, uh, they say that that seems like we're dancing right up to the line of becoming a sanctuary county or a sanctuary city. Are we a sanctuary county in, in your mind? Well, I'll tell you, the dance uh, up to a line that I'm more concerned about is dancing away from the line of being what makes this country great. Uh, there was 30,000, some estimates, uh, folks. I mean, it was an enormous crowd. I think the biggest I have ever seen. Uh, and when I looked out at this group, this wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, some other rallies you've seen. It wasn't people who were primarily there to have whatever worthy cause, but to make noise about something. There wasn't a lot of, uh, there were people who love this country, who want to work, who are working. Uh, it was bipartisan, which was fantastic. Uh, I don't think, you know, it, it, the clarity that immigration makes this country great is a partisan issue. Um, and as I said, among other things to the group, you know, 120 years ago, looking out at that crowd, this is German immigrants. That didn't make us weaker, it made us stronger, and so will you. And the moment we even seem like we're losing sight uh, in this country at any level of that central truth, that's the line that I'm worried about dancing up to. Um, you know, the notion that anyone instead is thinking, uh, oh, sanctuary city as a pejorative, nobody, just so we're clear, doesn't agree we need safety and protect the borders. Nobody is pro-terrorism, pro-crime, or anything like that. Uh, but the, when we start conflating those issues with opportunity, um, we miss a really big point. And you know, this just in, you don't have to pay too much uh, attention to you know, national, the national dialogue today to, to worry about maybe losing some of that clarity. What happens if Sheriff Clark, who, who uh, does not I see... I was waiting the, for... <laughs> please, please, please. Uh, what happens if, if Sheriff Clark, who has a different view of this, he, he agrees very much yeah. with the president um, uh, uh, about, um, in his view, illegal immigration being a problem in this country. What if he chooses to do as the president has asked? He has more of his deputies involved in uh, stopping and arresting people who... Uh, may have broken a law. And I, I would assume that would include being in the country illegally, could be considered breaking a law. Um, what if the sheriff goes in one direction? You, you've said one thing representing Milwaukee County. He's yeah. saying something quite different. How does that work? Well, I've actually had a lot of experience in the last six years with him saying one thing and me saying another. <laughs> um, he, the, the, uh, you know, I'll start with the way I always do. I would love, I really would, I would love to have a great relationship with the sheriff. I've got a good relationship with people who have very different political views than me, and probably like most people who come to lectures here, I'm not all that interested in looking for fights. I'm looking for solutions. Uh, you know, the biggest frustration and the same thing, the thing that Trump and Bernie have in common is a whole lot of their uh, supporters are not so much about the individual. They're frustrated with the status quo and the fact that so much energy and government goes into who gets the credit, who wins, who loses, and this factionalism that the Founding Fathers, again, repeatedly warned us against. They were terrified of factions. Well, they, boy, have we, like, trumped on fa factions now. I mean, it's, you know, when you say, I'm running for office and I promise I will work across the aisle with anybody, that's a dangerous thing politically these days. Someone will primary you. 
Uh, my frustration uh, uh, with the sheriff, it's not personal, it's not political, uh, it's just seeing uh, public service and public leadership as citizenship, uh, you know, the minimum standard of comporting yourself with civility and respect, uh, and looking for solutions, not encouraging divisiveness. And to be really clear, and I also always include this, there are a lot of great people in his department uh, who do care about uh, this county. They take it seriously. I mean, at that rally, I was talking to some of the folks who work for the department, and they're saying, we don't want to arrest people. Uh, and they frankly pointed out that for a giant crowd like this, it was incredibly peaceful, any more than deputies who pulled aside a, uh, a Packer fan who looked at the sheriff the wrong way. They didn't want to you know, detain the guy. When he asked his deputies to arrest parks workers for taking down a snow fence around Sherman Park, they didn't want to arrest the parks workers. They'd work with the parks workers. Uh, and uh, so if he wants uh, to participate in the 287 program, and that's the program that uh, enables local law enforcement to act as immigration agents, um, you know, you can't guarantee what can happen, but what you can do is look what has happened when these programs have been embraced. And there's a reason that in a bipartisan way, both sides have pulled back from this kind of program. Uh, Maricopa County, uh, where uh, Sheriff Joe, former, formerly uh, America's toughest sheriff, um, uh, embrace that program, they're still paying a $50 million lawsuit because what happened? They profiled Latinos really extensively. That doesn't help build police community relations. And again, no amount of saying this means anybody doesn't care about the law, doesn't care about safety. They just care about getting there in a mature uh, and objective, evidence-based way that doesn't even come close to trampling on the values uh, of embracing uh, immigrants. I've got uh, two or three quick questions left, and then we'll take about 15 minutes of uh, audience questions. I um, want to talk a little bit uh, about um, your experience with this Opportunity School District, okay? So this was created by the legislature, um, designed to have uh, some struggling schools in Milwaukee become part of this new school district. You were given the authority by the legislature to name a superintendent for that district, or the leader of that district you did, the Mequon School Superintendent, Damon Means. Um, that all seems to have just sort of gone away. Well, the, is that, my question is, is that idea dead? And, and the other part of the question is, were you surprised at the reaction to it? Uh, well, okay, uh, is the idea dead? So the way the legislation was written, uh, it, the schools that would be applicable for the district uh, have to be on the state list of failing schools, and because the state has changed its uh, sort of system, kind of common evaluation system, they're no longer sets on that it. they're no longer on it. Um, and so right now there aren't schools that, that are eligible. Uh, is it the tactic I would have, uh, you know, chosen to uh, try and improve the district? No, and I shared that with uh, Senator Darling and Representative Coinga uh, at the time. Um, do I think uh, that uh, as many failing schools or at least poor performing schools as we have in MPS is acceptable? No way. Uh, I, the biggest frustration I had uh, in the, that whole discussion was uh, we, I think we, we, we focused on the wrong variable. Uh, you know, uh, instead, of, instead of saying, look, can we all agree that in any public school district, a significant percentage of schools, particularly in the hardest hit neighborhoods that are clearly not doing uh, enough for the families and the kids who attend there is a problem. Um, and then can we then agree that, all right, if it's a scaled problem, we need to address it with a scaled solution. Uh, and instead, it became sort of like so many issues do, kind of this binary, either you support everything unconditionally or you hate everything, which describes usually like zero people. Um, you know, I'm a huge Packer fan and there are times, I, I got some suggestions for improvements. Doesn't mean I'm not a Packer fan. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, I think the problem we've got in education policy here is, you know, there's some great charter schools, there's some great voucher schools, there's some great MPS schools, and they all have some disasters too. And too much energy goes into whose ideology is being validated right now, uh, who wins, who loses, and, you know, kids and families aren't served by that. And uh, frankly, care less about the name on the school. What they care about, there's a quality education. I do think it's got to be public and accessible for everyone, non-selective, and I do think that's a critically important ro uh, 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 role. I guess 
uh, I'm hoping that the legislature, uh, you know, in addition to more resources, because I think that's got to be part of it, uh, you know, is is just is not passive and maybe involve and you know involves the district, obviously. But you know, in, unless we're all aligned on the goal's got to be you know, a much higher percentage of the schools in the system being high-performing schools, then we've got the wrong goal. I want to talk about a, another part of, of your life, and, and you're, you're a big booster. Milwaukee, you've been that way since you came here, I think, since 1994 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things you've done, you, you've been in business uh, throughout your, uh, your life, and, and so you've got a couple of things going that are, I think, really interesting in terms of the startup culture in Milwaukee, and we see these studies that say we're lagging behind some other cities. Well, you've got a, a venture capital fund uh, that you're part of that's investing in some of these young companies. You helped start Ward 4, which some of you know where the Pritzloff building is. If you go and you look at the, uh, the train station downtown and the post office, it's just east of the post office where the Pritzloff building is. It's called uh, um, Ward 4, and so it's a startup hub. Mm -hmm. So you've been investing in this. Where do you think the startup, because this is huge for our community, where is the startup uh, culture headed in Milwaukee? Uh, well, I think there's some great momentum. I mean, in addition to us, there's a ton of great uh, uh, groups that are working to empower uh, startup companies and the startup culture. There is slowly building, but more and more uh, capital uh, in it. And I like to think that every time we like to grow companies here, just with you know my fund hat on. Uh, if companies that we invest in, or we're going to be a lead in, aren't headquartered here now, uh, we'll often make it a condition of a being lead investor that they move here. I always say, you're not doing us a favor, we're doing you a favor, you'll figure it out. Uh, and they come here, and we've had quite a few, I mean, we've got you know, two companies from MIT that have moved here. Uh, you know, not a dime in public subsidy. They're growing, hiring people, and they love Milwaukee. Um, and I'm like, please tell people in Milwaukee it's okay to love Milwaukee. Uh, and I will even sometimes hear from them that you guys are so cynical about stuff. I said, I know, and I've been here 20 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we can do that at the scale we've been doing at, you know, I mean, we can keep growing that. Uh, I think there are certainly opportunities for uh, the state, uh, you know, policy-wise, uh, to make a few changes that I think could potentially increase even uh, faster the amount of out-of-state investment in venture here, um, and that's something we've talked to legislators about. Uh, Is there even more sort of the, the big legacy corporations in this town could be doing to help support the, the startup uh, community? Well, increasingly they are. Um, it's North interesting. Mutual doing North, something, right? Yeah, and increasingly you've got companies, I mean, just as an example, like Direct Supply, which has always, you know, had a great commitment to Milwaukee. They've grown and grown and grown. But one of the ways they grow is they have their own uh, sort of department that uh, they go to all the sort of different medical companies, startup incubators around the country, and they are always looking to uh, grow uh, uh, by essentially acquiring startups that they think can add value. But the thing is, as a model of growth for large companies, this this notion of having essentially a department of startups, you know, ish, uh, is a relatively new thing. Uh, but I think it's uh, because it's been fairly successful, you're seeing more and more of it. Uh, and I'm hoping that can be a part. And when you've got companies like Johnson Controls here, you right. know, 200,000 employees around the world-ish, uh, you know, I mean, as people have said forever, the more of their supply chain companies they can help leverage moving to here, uh, the better. Uh, and they do have some leverage. I mean, they've always been a great corporate citizen. So these final two minutes, I'll ask you about your political future because... Um, People speculate about what you might do someday. Uh, your name has been mentioned from time to time as a possible candidate for governor, a, a Democratic candidate for governor in 2018. So are you ruling that out at this stage of your, uh, of your political career? So I was joking with a friend the other day about, I, I was trying to think, I wonder how many times I, I can say, it's a very reasonable question, of course, uh, that no, I, I, I'm, not, uh, 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 I'm not, I'm uh, not running for uh, governor. Um, and I mean, the why is just this. Um, you know, I said, and you know, maybe it sounds sort of trite, but part of what I want to do is earn back faith of go in government. And one of the things that uh, it leads to a lot of people 
you know, that earns some cynicism in government is how many people say they're going to do X and then they don't do X. Uh, I ran because I love the county and I love public service. I love Milwaukee. I want to move. Nothing against Madison, but uh, I know we're being filmed. Uh, I love Madison, nice town, but I love Milwaukee. Uh, I don't want to move, uh, and I've got a lot more I want to do. Uh, I've built uh, an incredible team that I feel really great about. I feel like we've got more momentum and more, you know, we know more about what we're doing. We have more momentum, better resource than we've ever been, uh, and I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then... Uh, Couldn't the you do more, though, if you, were, if you were, you know, you've talked about how Milwaukee kind of, uh, is not getting perhaps its fair share of, mm -hmm. of the money coming out of Madison. Couldn't you do more as governor to address that than you can as county executive? <laughs> I'm not encouraging you, believe me. Apparently I'm just not. saying that's just that, that's what a, a yeah. person sitting here might ask. Yeah. It's my campaign manager. No, though. no. no. Uh, believe me, I'm no one's yeah. campaign <laughs> yes, manager. No, I know. Uh, well, actually, so, uh, well, I have a lot of. Uh, ideas that are solidly in the category of um, I think that Milwaukee can do a lot more sometimes than I think Milwaukee thinks. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I am such an admirer and good friend of uh, you know the president of this university, Mike Lovell, is uh, he's a, another unapologetically proud Milwaukeean. Um, and he's got big ideas for just how far and how much we can do. Uh, we talk about this a lot. Uh, and to me, uh, so big idea number one, I think, you know, government can get a lot more efficient. Uh, I mean, I think if step one is try and make the most nimble, efficient, empowering uh, county I can uh, at the county, I mean, ideally, to be a model for the country, that'd be great. Then step two is, all right, how do we get all the governments around Milwaukee to be less turfy, sort of city versus county versus suburbs, and more aligned? Um, I mean, there's little examples of uh, suboptimum outcomes for all of you because you're paying for all of these levels of government uh, all over the place. I think that could change. You'd love um, to see a metropolitan style government. Something like that, yeah. Someday. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then a bigger idea, uh, move the capital. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so wait, just, just hear me out on this one. Uh, so, so. Uh, you may lot. love Madison, but I don't think they're going to love you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Well, so, so here's my thing in that. So first, it'll surprise nobody that there's actually a fair amount of research uh, that looks at states where the capital is also the largest density of population and states where the capital is far afield. And the, the common patterns will not surprise anyone in this room. Uh, it's hard for somebody, however well intended, towards Milwaukee, who spends extremely little time you know, directly encountering the realities and challenges and opportunities in Milwaukee to be making the best decisions. Uh, second, uh, there, uh, there's a precedent. Plenty of uh, states have moved their capitals. Uh, Rhode Island used to rotate their capital at one point. I know they don't count. It's like 45 minutes to drive across. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, just in the department of, OK, cynical accepting the inevi inevitability, I guess my pushback on the, well, we couldn't do it is, all right, well, we'd start any, any, any project like that with, well, what do you have to work with? Uh, how about, by far, the most voters, taxpayers, employers, corporate donors, uh, how about uh, if I go and ask uh, my colleagues in Waukesha, um, you know, I have a good relationship with Paul Farrow as the Waukesha County Exec, and most of the counties around here, and I said, look, you tell me, would you rather have the capital in Madison, or would you like to have it right here where you can hop in the car and drive over? Uh, I mean, between the surrounding counties in Milwaukee, you've got close to half the state. You've got a lot more uh, to work with and a pretty great argument. Uh, uh, and, and again, nothing against Madison. Uh, but, um, you know, you can't talk me out of thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm closer to that than governor. <laughs> or I'm not running for sheriff either. Maybe. Let me take a few questions from the audience. If you're down here, you, you know the, the routine. You press on the rim. Not on the ball, on the rim. Keep your finger down. We'll be able to hear the question. If you have a question in the back, Ryan is the man with the microphone. We ask that you keep your questions brief so we can get to as many as possible. No speeches, please. We'll start here. Yes. Thank you. On the rim. There you go. Just keep your finger on that rim, and we'll make sure it works. I don't see the light lighting. Well, it'll be good. Oh, there Take we go. Take my word for Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much for being here. My question has to do with our park system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing the park system in the next five years, and how can the parks be sustained with the limited tax levy? That's a great, great question. question. Thank you. A great question. Uh, I think the biggest challenge the parks have, uh, well, the two, one, the accumulated deferred maintenance. Uh, some of you recall the policy form did an estimate of deferred capital maintenance around uh, the county, the majority of which is in parks, and it's about a quarter billion dollars. Um, we have, we address that typically at the county with bonding, um, so borrowing, and we have a cap. Uh, and the cap is uh, uh, around $40 million, and it's hard to catch up uh, with that level uh, of deferred maintenance uh, when you've only got 40. Plus, um, a lot of the services at the county that we provide are mandated, state and federally mandated, so we don't have the discretion to say just not provide it. Parks, oddly, is not. Parks is one of the discretionary services, and I think that's part of the reason over the decades that when any county exec and board have been in tight fiscal situations, it's easier for them to look at a discretionary service to cut than a mandated one. Uh, but the bigger issue, the biggest issue, is revenue. Um, one of the things I liked about the idea with the wheel tax that we were trying to look at is uh, at uh, $60, in the budget that included a $60 uh, wheel tax had, uh, instead of about an $80 million capital budget, about $130 million and with less borrowing. So one of the things we're trying to do is, even for capital stuff, more cash finance, less, you know, less debt incurring. Uh, and uh, what I was thinking then is, look, I want to not just be able to keep you know, paying down debt, I want to accelerate on catching up on deferred maintenance uh, and, you know, what I've wanted for six years, get as fast as I can to the point where we start a year not talking about where are we going to have to cut, uh, but where can we invest? Uh, and I think uh, either, uh, well, some combination, there's got to be more revenue somehow. Um, I know periodically there's a discussion about should you have a parks district. Creating a district alone wouldn't do much unless you have revenue with it. Um, I remember floating with some people the idea of, okay, well, MMSD has uh, revenue. They do parks, they do maintenance, they have fleet. They do a lot of partnerships with parks right now. What if you had a sort of department of parks and greens or something? Um, because one thing you also address is, as long as it's a discretionary department in a budget that includes, that's finite and includes a lot of mandated uh, services, it's, Parks is always going to be vulnerable to that issue. And the other one related to this past weekend is trying to grow earned revenue. Um, we've actually had a fair amount of success growing earned revenue. I mean, notably the beer gardens, but not just that. Uh, incidentally, uh, the beer gardens this last weekend uh, now, we have mobile beer gardens now, so actually we can deploy a beer garden like um, <laughs> And that's our friends uh, at Sprecher, uh, they built these, they rehab these fire trucks, so there's no water tanks, there's like kegs, and they're great. Uh, and, uh, and they're very creative, enterprising people. And uh, so we said, hey, how fast can you get one of these things out for the weekend? It's going to be 70. And they're like, yeah, sure. And so they're out there, and I thought we had maybe a couple hundred people, and I don't know if you followed. Yeah, well, thousands. Yeah, it was like an hour-long wait to get to the, yeah. And the golf, I mean, we've done 500 rounds at Grant, 500 rounds at Lincoln um, just on the weekend. Uh, but can, you can know, I ask you a real quick yeah. follow-up on that? What about this idea of a, a tax, a, a, a half percent sales tax, for instance, in Milwaukee County that would pay for, you know, some of our cultural amenities, the art museum, help pay for that, but also perhaps have some money available to help with parks? Is that something you'd be willing to look at? Uh, well, I, you know, I'll get to you. In a the, the issue there is less about me and more about uh, the state legislature. Yeah, they got to give you permission to do it. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I'm just, you know, right and wrong. I, I just, I doesn't doesn't seem yeah. like it's going to. I mean, happen. but that said, do I think it's worth working hard to try and find some other revenues for that? Absolutely. All yeah. Right. Let me take this question right there. Yes, sir. In your uh, 2013 State of the County Address, you um, announced a controversial plan to shift 180 long-term mentally ill people that had previously been at the mental health complex mm -hmm. to private, um, for-profit community settings. Um, and you announced that that would happen within three years, and you were successful in doing that. That mm -hmm. program ended at the end of last year, or at the start of last year. Um, an audit came out in December that would show the results of that program, um, but the state auditors found that there was no data um, to show the quality of care that those people had received. Um, all the data showed was that 
only 149 of the 180 patients that have been shifted to community settings were still receiving county funded care. And 27 of those people have unknown whereabouts. I'm just wondering specifically on the long term care patients, what, um, what is the status? What have the health, health outcomes been since you announced that plan in uh, 2013? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not sure about uh, the data that you just suggested. I can tell you this. Um, let's start with this premise. Uh, every year we've been here, uh, we've put a hell of a lot more resources into uh, Behavioral Health Division and, and tax levy. We've invested a ton more into community care. Um, there is uh, every single placement that went from a long-term care institution to somewhere else involved a state agency. Uh, well, as you know, Dennis, I mean, Disability Rights Wisconsin, a bunch of different groups, family care for every single one. Everybody had sign off. We wouldn't uh, have let anybody go without knowing that their plan is going to be the right one for them, and we are hardly the only agency, nor should we be looking at that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, one thing I do know, I do know that uh, uh, when other, other uh, communities that have moved out of long-term care, and as you know, we were one of the last in the United States that still did the large facilities, long-term care, uh, when other people have done this, uh, generally, it's a really tricky process, and often there's, you know, people come back uh, to the system or come back to uh, 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 the, uh, the acute hospital. In our case, as far as I know, uh, it's relatively, I mean, I think it's one or two, but I mean, relative to those transitions, better than, you know, better than average. But regardless, there's never going to be a time when I don't think we can do better. Uh, and there's never going to be a time when, uh, you know, we're going to stop being uh, vigilant about the providers we have uh, or trying to hold them accountable or increasing our ability to do that. There's never going to be a time when we're blithely throwing your money at any provider, um, uh, nonprofit or not, uh, uh, you know, without uh, clear accountability. Uh, but one good thing is we don't do long-term care anymore. We don't have buildings where, like we did where people hadn't been out of the building in you know, 10 years, 20 years. People didn't do that anymore. We don't have that. Uh, we're serving more people. We have fewer involuntary detentions. Uh, we have a hell of a lot more peer counselors. Uh, and again, is there still work to do? Uh, yeah, there is, but we're just doing it a lot faster. Is it perfect? You know, we can always improve. I got time for one more question. There's a gentleman over there. If you can wait for a second for Ryan to bring the microphone and, and ask you to keep your question brief so we can fit it in here. Thank you. How are you doing, uh, County Executive? Um, I'm a Sherman Park resident, and um, I wanted to ask you, are you aware of the program that the City of Milwaukee Police Department has uh, in an effort to get a restraining order against homeless people from coming downtown in parts of the city? They take it and arrest them. Um, so that's driven homelessness into the neighborhoods. In my neighborhood in Sherman Park, there are dozens and dozens of homeless people. I have a homeless person living in a, a, a van in my alley. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, are you aware of the fact that uh, homelessness in the neighborhoods is almost worse than ever? And these are these are people who live on the street, not people who are who are uh, couch surfing. These are people on the street, and it's in the neighborhood. It's rampant, actually. I was wondering, are you aware of that? And are you aware of the program that the city of Milwaukee has in an effort to create a restraining or get a restraining order against homeless people uh, from coming downtown. Yeah, I, I am not aware of uh, the MPD program, but trust me, I will look into that. We work with MPD a lot, including with our uh, homeless uh, uh, task force. They work with BHD, they work with DHHS, we work with the continuum of care, and we try to coordinate. I think we do more of that. I do know as a result, one of the many results of dealing with chronic homelessness is that while the chronically homeless represent uh, at any given time a relatively small percentage, and if you take a snapshot right now in Milwaukee, you know, it's a small percentage of who's homeless. However, if you look at bed days over the year, just definitionally, because these are people who are almost you know, a year or longer or more, um, uh, it's a big percentage. And because we've reduced that, the capacity at Hope House, at Guest House, at a lot of the shelters, uh, I mean, that's freed up their capacity. I mean, they have more beds than they used to. Again, same thing. Could we be doing more? Yeah, um, you know, and we're going to. Um, one of the nice things about the success of the program is we've been able to attract more funding for it, more resources, uh, and I'll absolutely follow up. I'm not aware of that program. Like, actual restraining orders, that's, yeah, that would be a concern. Actually, just so you'll be able to find the program a little bit better. Um, when Don Church Hamilton was shot, a lot of people remember the police came and they left. Well, the business owner, of, well, the, well, the 
worker at Starbucks was able to call a police officer on his personal cell phone, give inform to him for this program, and that's why he was he came again and acted so aggressively because he was and and I went to the hearing and they, he stated in the hearing that he was only uh, reprimanded twice and that was for not performing an arrest when giving a t giving a ticket to homeless people. They are they 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 are told to to perform an arrest every single time. And once you get the arrest, three arrests, you can file a restraining order against that person. They can't, can't come past 12th Street anymore. So thank you, thank right you for here. your comments and your question. Appreciate it. Anything you want to add to that? Or you're, you're going to look Just, into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, MPD right. is obviously the okay. city. Uh, that said, we work with uh, MPD on a lot of things. And uh, if that's the case, yes, that concerns me. I'll certainly follow up. I'm going to wrap things up there. Before we go, uh, a couple of things just to let you know about what we're up to here at the, the law school. We have a couple of events coming up in the next uh, week. Actually, tomorrow we still have a few seats remaining. We're going to be looking at the uh, opioid crisis in Wisconsin. It is of uh, epidemic proportions, a public health crisis. We will have the uh, co-chairs of the governor's task force on opioid abuse. Lieutenant Governor Clayfish and Representative John Nigram will be with us. Uh, Representative Nigram's uh, daughter, Cassie, has been battling a, a heroin addiction. Uh, I think it's an important discussion. Um, more than 300 people, you can speak to this. I mean, there were more than 300 people in Milwaukee County last year died from opioid overdoses. Mm -hmm. More than 300, more than twice the number of homicides in the yeah. city. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. Still a few seats available uh, for that. Coming up next week, Tuesday, uh, Tom Nichols uh, is an author. He is a Naval War College professor. He's written a pretty provocative book called The Death of Expertise. And uh, it's a very appropriate book uh, to be discussed at this moment in our history. I think uh, he'll be an interesting <laughs> guest. It's, uh, well, he makes, a, he makes an interesting argument. Not everybody agrees with him, and you might not agree with him, but it's an interesting and uh, um, very, um, uh, well, it's just a good argument to, to listen to. Um, so he's going to be here. I mention that because even you can't get a seat to that unless you're already registered, but you can watch our events live on our website. For example, today's event was live, so if you can't get in to do that, you can watch live. Um, so we've got that. Darian Driver, uh, the MPS superintendent, coming up on March 8th. Uh, so if you have a chance, that too is sold out. If you have a chance to join us, keep checking our website, law.marquette.edu. We keep updating. We've got some more really good programs coming up in the next uh, couple of months. So we hope you will join us. Again, thanks to everyone who came today, took time away from this beautiful, typical February weather to be with us. It's great to see you. Thanks for your interest. And thanks again to Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abelos. Thank you very much.